Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks, for leading us. It's good to see you today. Good to be with you. I trust you've had a good week in the Lord, experiencing His goodness, His kindness, His mercy, which follows all the days of our lives, those of us who are in Christ. I trust that even in the difficult providences this week that you have known Him and met Him and sensed His love for you. I want to speak today before we, in all likelihood next week, launch back into the study of Mark where we were uh, back before my surgeries began. Today I want to talk to you, just ask the question, let's look at the scripture, is love really all you need? We've already read our text, we read it in the reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13. Our text today is that 13th verse which simply asks or makes the observation, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And we need to remind ourselves, I do this every Sunday, I hope you don't get tired of it, we do not do well ever to forget that when we read the Word of God, when we, when we hear the Word of God read, taught, preached, sung, we're hearing what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. In it, we find everything we need for life and godliness. And we need to be taught about life and godliness. We need to be enabled to live godly lives in this dark and decaying generation. We lost a great light yesterday in the death of Judge Antonin Scalia. Uh, probably the most articulate, strict constru constructionist on the Supreme Court holding the line for truth and light and liberty. We do not take each day for granted. And I would submit to you that his death has raised the stakes incalculably for our presidential race next fall. Who recognizes these lyrics? There's nothing you can do that can't be done, nothing you can sing that can't be sung, nothing you can say but you can learn how to play the game, it's easy. Nothing you can make that can't be made, nothing you can save that can't be saved, nothing you can do but you can learn how to be you in time, it's easy. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. Recognize that, anybody? July of 1967, the Beatles launched that song, which became a huge hit, and sadly has messed with the minds of not a few people. Now, when you read that, you recognize that it's like a lot of the songs written in the 60s and the 70s. The lyrics don't make any sense, really. I mean, unless you're on drugs, perhaps. Maybe if you were hallucinating or had something, you know, then. But the assertion, all you need is love. I've done marriage counseling and pre-marriage counseling for 40 years now. Pre-marriage counseling is usually me talking to a couple that's, that's anticipating getting married. They're, they're madly in love. I haven't, I haven't met a couple yet that sat down in my office that was pensive about the whole thing or tentative about it or really wondering. No, they, by the time they get to me, they're madly in love. In fact, by the time they get to me, they've already ordered their invitations. They've already, you know, they've... And I begin to talk to them about reality, about commitment and what commitment takes and how it's a, a daily rising to intentionally give yourself away to another. How it's going to be important to communicate clearly, to be a good listener. My mother told me when I was young, I guess she saw that I, I talked a lot. She said, Bill, if you're always talking, 
you're never learning. Teach them to listen. Teach them to expect and anticipate conflict, hopefully not cause it, but they will cause it. And when a conflict does come, to show them how to work through conflict resolution. And the whole time I'm doing this over the period of six weeks, there's just, their, their eyes are just filled with stars and, and they're thinking but not telling me, oh, I know that's true of some, but it'll never be true of us. And I think every now and then, every now and then, it seems to me that perhaps a, a star or two actually flies out of, of the eyes and it just flitters around the room for a little while. It's, They believe they can live on love. They believe without saying it and without perhaps ever having heard the Beatles song that because of the love they have for each other that's really all they need. Marriage comes. The wedding is the easy part. Marriage comes. Reality sets in. In some way, shape, or form, at various times or another, love doesn't seem to be enough. They become shattered and disillusioned, and if it happens long enough, they're back in my office with their relationship in a bushel basket in, in about 10,000 pieces saying, can you help us put this back together? The assertion has been made in our culture and it's pushed today in great uh, intensity that all you need is love. If we would just, in fact, I heard a preacher of another denomination, I won't call the denomination, but I heard him preach this years ago that, that if we will simply love like we're supposed to love, then it will go away. There'll be no hell. That hell is simply the absence of love. So it's not just the common population, it's people who have doctors before their names and who wear robes and would have us believe that all you need is love. I want to submit to you this morning that the scripture does not teach that. It teaches us some great things about love. That passage we read is one of the greatest passages in all the scripture and I would submit in all of literature on love. But you better pay close attention to what it says. Because you see, contrary to Ally McGraw and Ryan O'Neill in the movie Love Story, love means you will always be willing to say you're sorry. Not never have to say you're sorry. The kind of love we're talking about. Peter said it this way, most of all, love each other as if your life depended on it. Love makes up for practically anything. Someone's given a modern rendering of 1 Corinthians 13 that I, that I like. I want to just read it to you this morning. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. It's a pretty good restatement. I want to submit to you that when we read 1 Corinthians 13, I appreciate Brother Norman saying, don't read that like you're remembering some wedding you went to. It, it, it wasn't written for a wedding. It was written to a church that was about to bust apart at the seams over controversies surrounding 
the expression and use of the spiritual gifts. Chapter 12, chapter 14, read those sometime. You'll see uh, there's a knockdown drag out. Looks like it's about to happen in the church at Corinth over these things. Paul says, let's do all we do with love. But when he closes that section, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I find it interesting that he puts these three things together. I would submit to you that love is not only not all you need, love without faith and hope is not a love that will sustain you in life. I want to submit to you that lo the love spoken of here is fueled by faith and fanned by hope. The love spoken of in this text is the Greek word agape. We've talked about it before in different settings. In fact, I've preached on 1 Corinthians 13, 1 uh, through 8 before, and, and we've gone through what, that, what love is and what it, what it does, what it does not do, how it acts. While love is a concept, in this setting, love is, a, is an action. It's agape love here. Every time it shows up as love in your text, it's the word agape in the Greek. And that word was a common word in the Greek language. It was a strong love. But Jesus took that word and he made it bigger than it ever had been. In the mouth of Jesus, Simon Peter, do you love me? It is a word that shows a willingness to love its object unconditionally, motivated by nothing in the object. Now, let's be honest. Most relationships don't start out there. When I was a growing young man and something happened to Karen Dunchy over the summer, I thought, man, she's hot. That was, that was Eros love. That was a love, it's not, Eros not a bad word. Erotic is, is bad when it's used of all the pornography that goes on, but, but Eros love that that recognition of the beauty of an object. I wanted to get to know her better. We'd grown up together, born three days apart, lived three blocks apart, went to the same school, went to the same church, but, but when she started growing taller and I was, I was staying pretty much the same, and she looked like a, a giant girl, and I didn't, I wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in girls at all, by the way, but I, not a giant one, surely. I mean, one that was 5'3", for crying out loud. But when I recognized her hotness, I wanted to get to know her better, all right? And as I did, I found out that there was this phileo love. It's a, a friendship love. We had a, had a lot in common. I mean, it was just it was amazing how we... How we even though if you looked at us on paper, you would think <laughs> nothing in common. And there was a lot, there was a lot of uh, the opposites that made us very magnetic, that attracted. I, I told jokes, she laughed at all my jokes, and it was, it, was, it was a rewarding experience to be around her. Phileo love. We, we hung out on the tennis court. M most of our dates were playing tennis for two or three hours. We grew, kept growing, became Christ followers for real, rather than religious church members who'd been baptized. And then agape love came on the horizon. Well, you love her when she's not hot anymore. You say, that's what agape love asks. And I don't know the answer to that yet because she's not gotten to the point where she's not hot anymore. But the day will surely come. 
Will you love her when she doesn't laugh at your jokes anymore? When that phileo may fade? Is the love you have for her agape love? Will it sustain the relationship? Well, so far, thank the Lord, for 41 years it has. And we couldn't even imagine at the outset. This is a strong love, but you see, the only way agape love can be present in anyone's life, listen to me now, is if the Holy Spirit abides in that person's life as a result of the grace of God in salvation, convincing that person that Jesus Christ died and rose again for sinners to be saved. Faith. The reason that now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, is because faith is absolutely essential. Not any faith, saving faith. In fact, Hebrews 11:6 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God, please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, that, it, that He is, and that He rewards those who seek Him. You see, if without faith it's impossible to please God, then how on earth could I without faith? Please, my wife. Truth of the matter is, without faith, I would, I would just simply live a life being displeased when she doesn't please me. Agape love only exists in a healthy format where saving faith is vibrant, real and vibrant. When we find ourselves moving along in life and find ourselves consumed with ourselves more and more increasingly, then we need to stop. It's just a fair thing to stop and ask, what kind of faith do I have? Do I have just head faith that I believe these things about Jesus have been told to me and that I've read in the Word? Or do I have saving faith that's not only gripped my mind to, to transform my thinking, but heart faith as well that, that follows that beautiful picture. If you've, if you've had any marriage counseling, premarital counseling, been to a marriage seminar at all, you know the triangle. Here's you and here's your spouse. Here's God at the top of the triangle. The closer you draw to God the closer you draw to your spouse. Is that, is that the faith that I have? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I would submit to you, without faith, it's impossible to show agape love. You can have, you can have a love. It can be a love of the, of, the, of the physical condition, the physical attraction, the physical emotions that attend. It can be love of a friendship type where you just, you know, the hours pass away, seem like minutes when you're together, but that will not sustain you. Paul's basically saying to the Corinthians here, being friends with one another, phileo love, is not going to keep conflict from coming to the Corinthian congregation. And they were full of conflict if you know anything about them. What's, so, so apply that to us. What, what will keep us from engaging in more conflict. It's not friendship love because this group of fellow friends and this group of fellow friends may team up against one another. <laughs> but this group of agape lovers and this group of agape lovers will find common ground at the cross. Josh said it right. What is love? What does it look like? Look to Jesus Christ. It's interesting, isn't it? The scripture tells us Jesus Christ entrusted himself to the Father. Now, he didn't need saving faith, but Jesus, Jesus had a faith and a trust in God, his Father, that no matter how it seemed things were going wrong on earth, it was moving exactly where the Father intended it to go and where Jesus knew it would go. But, but there was that relationship with the Father where he, he entrusted himself to God. He had that relationship to the, to the Father where, where his, his hope, he looked beyond the circumstances to the day of glory when he would return to be with the Father. That was his hope. It's interesting. He, he is our blessed hope now. We look beyond our circumstances and see 
toward the day, but I get ahead of myself here. Faith fuels agape love. Without it, you can try as hard as you want to. You can say, okay, today I am going to be, I'm going to love unselfishly. And that will work great until you encounter another human being. And that determination becomes like so many <laughs> New Year's resolutions. It just fizzles and fades. And, and the enemy of our soul steps in and whispers and says, Oh, you're such a liar. He discourages us. We won't love agape love by determining it with intense... Oh. We love with agape love when we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the very one who is the essence of agape love, who, who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom, who laid down his life for his friends, who denied himself every day of his life on earth and is even now denying himself, as we said last week, reminding you that he's denying himself of partaking of the fruit of the vine until we're all there with him. Oh, what a Savior. Receiving Jesus Christ into our lives by, by grace through faith, trusting in his atoning work. Simple childlike faith. It doesn't, you don't have to have a PhD to have faith. You can have the faith of a child who simply believes, takes God at his word, repents of sin. Faith fuels love. The love spoken of here. Well, the second thing you need to think about is that hope fans the flames of love. Twelve times in the book of Romans, twelve times Paul mentions the word hope. In Romans 5, 2, he says, through him, through Jesus, we have obtained access by faith, look at the interchange of these words here, into this grace in which we are standing and we are rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Oftentimes what you see around you in life, what you're experiencing in life may not be an occasion for rejoicing. Sometimes those little precious providences come and they're an occasion for an outburst of of joy, but oftentimes you've got to look beyond the circumstances. The hope of the glory of God. What's it mean? The hope of the day when the glory of God will be fully revealed. Because you see, when you're saved by grace through faith, there is, there is enlivened in you the realization that you were made for one primary purpose, and that was to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And you begin to desire to do that and to seek to do that and discover how to do that and gather with other people who are doing that and watch that and observe that and follow that and learn that to glorify God by loving Him and doing what He commands. And when we are given to that as men and women and boys and girls of faith who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, then the glory of God looms large. We take to heart Paul's expression to the Corinthians, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Longing for the day when the glory of God will appear. Ah, the blessed hope. Jesus Christ. Well, again, he carries this on through Romans 4, chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. He's talking about life and life's pressures. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. See the squeeze that you and I get in life? It's designed to flush out of us the nastiness, that, that remaining sin that hinders us. And make more room for us to be filled with the fresh water of the living Spirit of God. And we find ourselves having stood at places saying, how on earth will I get through this? Walking by faith, step by step, and looking back and discovering by God's grace, He is helping us to endure, to persevere. 
And when we do endure and persevere, our character is enhanced. We are, we are being molded increasingly to the image of Jesus Christ. And as we become more and more like Christ, guess what blooms? Hope. Hope. And he tells us about this hope. You know, we use hope in a lot of different ways. There were probably a lot of people last week on Sunday afternoon saying, I sure hope that this team wins or that team wins in the Super Bowl. And there were some people who saw that, quote, hope fulfilled. There were many whose hopes were dashed. Hmm. We're talking about a different hope. This hope does not put us to shame. That is not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. You see, this hope fans the flame of the love of God that's been given to us. In Romans 8.20, he's talking about, it says, the creation was subjected to futility, not willing to, talk talking about the fall of man, but because of him who subjected it in hope. You see, the fall occurred and sin came into the world and we live in a fallen world now so that we will look for hope beyond ourselves. We will not look within ourselves, not look around ourselves. We'll look beyond ourselves to the blessed hope of Jesus Christ who has come once as the Lamb of God who is coming now, a second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And He is coming and we need to have hope in that. And we will have hope in that if we know Him now. Then a few verses down, verses eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 24, 25. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Isn't it interesting? And he goes, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Faith is described. Faith as, we, as the, as the uh, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen in, in Hebrews 11. But again, Faith is, a, is an invisible. Hope is an invisible. Fixed and focused on the reality of the visible coming of Jesus Christ. Faith is fixed on the fact that Jesus came and lived a sinless life and died a sin-bearing, wrath-appeasing death, satisfying divine justice by His suffering and dying on the cross and rising three days later from the grave. And faith latches hold of that. Hope is fixed on the reality of a, of a coming King again who will come a second time. This time, though, not to lay down His life. This time to take the lives of His enemies and to spare the lives of His people. And his faith remembers the cross. And his hope anticipates the return. Love is like a hammock in between those two mighty oaks. Nurturing, growing. In chapter 15, or chapter 12, verse 12, re rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. That's Hope fans the flames of love and it touches our prayer life. In chapter 15, verse 4, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through the endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Paul says the whole Old Testament was written for us that we might persevere and take encouragement and hope as it promises us a Savior. Well, we can say, and yes, Paul, and the whole, Old, the whole New Testament does the same. Monumentally more so. Romans chapter 15, verses 12 and 13. Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, and even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. But the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Look at how he uses hope there. Give the Gentiles hope. He's the God of hope. Abound in hope by the Holy Spirit. You see? 
joy, is joy fluttering in your life? Fading somewhat, perhaps? Peace, peace, check your hope. Not wishful thinking hope. Your hope in Jesus. That he, he did what he said he would do. He, every word he said was true. And he said he's coming again. And he is. And we anticipate the blessed hope. And because of that, all that it seems wrong now will be right. Will be made right. As we read 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says there's some things that will cease. Prophecies will cease. Tongues will cease. Knowledge will cease. And there's a discussion among theologians, and, and reasonable theologians differ on this. Some say that Paul says when the perfect has come, and they say, well, that's, that's when we're when the consummation of the age comes and we're all taken up into heaven, when that happens, then, then prophecies and tongues and knowledge will cease. I, I think because of what he says later that that's not what he's talking about. I, I tend to agree with those theologians who say that he's talking about when the, when, the per, when the canon has been perfected, when the scriptures have been completed, that prophecies, tongues, and knowledge in the, in the arena of the spiritual gifts will cease. And here's the thing. I'm not going to get off to a theological treatise on cessationism versus non-cessationism as it refers to the spiritual gifts and remarkable gifts. But I'm an almost, listen to me now, almost absolute cessationist. What I mean by that is I believe where the scripture is complete in the word and the language of the people that the need for prophecies and tongues and knowledge, divine knowledge, has, has ceased. But where, where there are unreached people groups who don't have a shred of our Bible. I believe you'll see the manifestation of these remarkable gifts to, to, uh, as, to do the same for them as was done on the day of Pentecost when the, when the 120 in the upper room came out and the people in the crowd said, you were speaking in your own language and we understood you in our language. When that powerful manifestation of tongues was given to convince them that, that this, is, this is the coming of Messiah. This is that which was prophesied by, by Joel. But here's, what, here's why I say that. Because he says, as surely as those things will cease when the perfect has come, he says, but now abide these things. Faith, hope, and love. We need them all three. All you need is faith, hope, and love. Need some other things, you know. But in faith, hope, and love, you find all that you need. You, it, they take you down the path for those other things. Faith in Jesus, hope that he's returning, and agape, unconditional love, birthed in your heart by the Holy Spirit. But think about it, folks. One day, either one by one, or when Jesus returns, we will step into glory. We will step into glory. What will we need there? Faith? No, the scripture talks about a day when faith will become sight. Will be replaced by sight. When we gaze with glorified bodies and glorified eyes. On the Savior. We won't need faith. Faith will become sight. Hope, the hope of his return, whether he comes back for us all together or whether he comes back for us one at a time and takes us home. Hope will fade because we will be with the blessed hope. We will not have to hope anticipating his return anymore. He will have returned for us. And all we will need, all that will remain in heaven is love. But don't you understand if while on this earth you had a love different from agape love that you will not step over into heaven? It, that love won't take you there. You see, it's the love accompanied by faith and hope that will bring us to the threshold of heaven. 
then if there's a right time and place and proper to sing it, we can cut out the stanzas and sing in heaven. All you need is love. All you need. Oh, brothers and sisters, practice that now. Practice that now. That'll be the one reality, the one, the one sanctified, glorified emotion, that one inescapable action that will carry us over into heaven. Saved by grace through faith, yes. Anticipating the return, yes. But when face to face with Jesus, for the first time, we'll be able to love Him with a love that He is worthy of being loved. In this last week, in the building up of this weekend of Valentine's Day and how to show love, I hope you've done that. But be sure, check yourself that the love you have is not a love that tends to come back and focus on you. Not a love that you're constantly going around wanting people to feed it and fill it. But a love, an agape love, an unconditional love that loves the unlovely, that loves those who don't love back, that, that loves those who don't want your help. And love with that love And that love, fanned by the faith in Christ, fueled by that, fanned by the hope of Jesus' return, I believe will make your life a powerful witness in a society that's been taught to love itself more than anything else. Love the one you're with. You can just go through myriads of lyrics that are so misguided. Love one another, Jesus said, as I have loved you. Let's pray.